I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. This week I'm going to read a few stories by O. Henry. O. Henry was born William Sidney Porter in 1862. He had a really rocky start in life, being convicted in 1898 of embezzling funds from the bank where he worked. He wrote and published several short stories while he was in prison, and on his release in 1901, he began writing short stories for the New York World Sunday Magazine. O. Henry died in 1910 at the age of 47. The stories I'm going to read today are from a collection called The Gentle Grafter, published in 1919, uh, about a couple of con men, um, Jeff Peters and Andy Tucker. First one is called Shearing the Wolf. Jeff Peters was always eloquent when the ethics of his profession was under discussion. The only time, said he, that me and Andy Tucker ever had any hiatuses in our cordial intents was when we differed on the moral aspects of grafting. Andy had his standards and I had mine. I didn't approve of all of Andy's schemes for levying contributions from the public, and he thought I allowed my conscience to interfere too often for the financial good of the firm. We had high arguments sometimes. One word led on to another until he said I reminded him of Rockefeller. I don't know how you mean that, Andy, says I, but we have been friends too long for me to take offense at a taunt that you will regret when you cool off. I have yet, says I, to shake hands with a subpoena server. One summer, me and Andy decided to rest up a spell in a fine little town in the mountains of Kentucky called Grassdale. We were supposed to be horse drovers and good, decent citizens besides, taking a summer vacation. The Grassdale people liked us, and me and Andy declared a cessation of hostilities, never so much as floating the flyleaf of a rubber concession prospectus or flashing a Brazilian diamond while we was there. One day, the leading hardware merchant of Grassdale drops around to the hotel where me and Andy stop and smokes with us, sociable on the side porch. We knew him pretty well from pitching quoits in the afternoons in the courthouse yard. He was a loud red man, breathing hard, but fat and respectable beyond all reason. After we talk on all the notorious themes of the day, this Murkison, for such was his entitlements, takes a letter out of his coat pocket in a careful, careless way and hands it to us to read. Now, what do you think of that? says he, laughing. A letter like that to me. Me and Andy sees at a glance what it is. But we pretend to read it through. It was one of them old-time typewritten green goods letters explaining how for a thousand dollars you could get five thousand dollars in bill that an expert couldn't tell from the genuine. And going on to tell how they were made from plates stolen by an employee of the Treasury at Washington. Think of sending a letter like that to me, says Murkison again. Lots of good men get them, says Andy. If you don't answer the first letter, they let you drop. If you answer it, they write again asking you to come on with your money and do business. But think of them writing to me, says Murkison. A few days later, he drops around again. Boy, says he, I know you are all right or I wouldn't confide in you. I wrote to them rascals again just for fun. They answered and told me to come on to Chicago. They said telegraph to Jay Smith when I would start. When I get there, I'm to wait on a certain street corner till a man in a gray suit comes along and drops a newspaper in front of me. Then I'm to ask him how the water is, and he knows it's me and I know it's him. Ah, yes, says Andy, gaping. It's the same old game. I've often read about it in the papers. Then he conducts you to a private abattoir in the hotel where Mr. Jones is already waiting. They show you brand new real money and sell you all you want at five for one. You see him put it in a satchel for you and you know it's there. Of course, it's brown paper when you come to look at it afterwards. Oh, they couldn't switch it on me, says Murkison. I haven't built up the best paying business in Grassdale without having witticisms about me. You say it's real money they show you, Mr. Tucker? I've always 
I see by the papers that it always is, says Andy. Boys, says Murkison, I've got it in my mind that them fellows can't fool me. I think I'll put a couple of thousand in my jeans and go up there and put it all over them. If Phil Murkison gets his eyes once on them bills, they show him, they show him he'll never take them off them. They offer me five for one, and they're going to have to stick to the bargain if I tackle them. That's the kind of traitor Bill Murkison is. Yes, I just believe I'll drop up Chicago way and take a five-to-one shot on Jay Smith. I guess the water will be fine enough. Me and Andy tries to get this financial misquotation out of Murkison's head, but we might as well have tried to keep the man who rolls peanuts with a toothpick from betting on Brian's election. No, sir. He was going to perform a public duty by catching these green good swindlers at their own game. Maybe it would teach him a lesson. After Murkison left us, me and Andy sat a while prepondering over our silent meditations and heresies of reason. In our idle hours, we always improved our higher selves by ratiocination and mental thought. Jeff, says Andy after a long time, quite unseldom have I seen fit to impugn your molars when you have been chewing the rag with me about your conscientious way of doing business. I may have been often wrong, but here is a case where I think we can agree. I feel that it would be wrong of us to allow Mr. Murkerson to go alone to meet those Chicago green goods men. There is but one way it can end. Don't you think we would both feel better if we was to intervene in some way and prevent the doing of this deed? I got up and shook Andy Tucker's hand hard and long. Andy, says I, I may have had one or two hard thoughts about the heartlessness of your corporation, but I retract them now. You have a kind nucleus at the interior of your exterior, after all. It does you credit. I was just thinking the same thing that you have expressed. It would not be honorable or praiseworthy, says I, for us to let Murkison go on with this project he has taken up. If he is determined to go, let us go with him and prevent this swindle from coming off. Andy agreed with me, and I was glad to see that he was in earnest about breaking up this green good scheme. I don't call myself a religious man, says I, or a fanatic in moral bigotry, but I can't stand still and see a man who has built up his business by his own efforts and brains and risk be robbed by an unscrupulous trickster who is a menace to the public good. Right, Jeff, says Andy. We'll stick right along with Murkison, if he insists on going, and block this funny business. I hate to see any, man, any money drop in it as bad as you would. Well, we went to see Murkelson. No, boys, says he. I can't consent to let this, the song of this Chicago siren waft by me on the summer breeze. I'll fry some fat out of this ignis fatuus or burn a hole in the skillet but I'd be plumb diverted to death to have you all go along with me. Maybe you could help some when it comes to cashing in the ticket to that five-to-one shot. Yes, I'd really take it as a pastime and an a regalement if you boys would go along too. Murkison's gives it out in Grassdale that he is going for a few days with Mr. Peters and Mr. Tucker to look over some iron ore property in West Virginia. He wires Jay Smith that he will set foot in the spider web on a given date and the three of us light out for Chicago. On the way, Merkelson amuses himself with premonitions and advanced pleasant recollections. In a gray suit, says he, on the southwest corner of Wabash Avenue and Lake Street. He drops the paper, and I ask how the water is. Oh, my, my, my. And then he laughs all over for five minutes. Sometimes Merkelson is, was serious and tried to talk himself out of his cogitations, whatever they was, Boys, says he, I wouldn't have this get out in Grassdale for ten times a thousand dollars. It would ruin me there. But I know you all are all right. I think it's the duty of every citizen, says he, to try and do up these robbers that prey upon the public. I'll show them whether the water's fine. Five dollars for one, that's what Jay Smith offers, and he'll have to keep his contract if he does business with Bill Murkison. We got into Chicago about 7 p.m. Murkison was to meet the gray man at half past nine. We had dinner at a hotel and then went up to Murkison's room to wait for the time to come. Now, boys, says Murkison, let's get our gumption together and inoculate a plan for defeating the enemy. 
Suppose, while I'm exchanging airy bandage with the gray capper, you gents come along by accident, you know, and holler, hello, Merc, and shake hands with symptoms of surprise and familiarity. Then I take the capper aside and tell him that you are Jenkins and Brown of Grassdale. Groceries and feed. Good men, and maybe they'll be w willing to take a chance while I'm, while they're away from home. Bring them along, he'll say, of course, if they care to invest. Now, how does that scheme strike you? What do you say, Jeff, says Andy, looking at me. Well, I'll tell you what I say, says I. Let's, I say, let's settle this thing right here now. I don't see any use of wasting any more time. I took a nickel-plated thirty-eight out of my pocket and clicked the cylinder around a few times. You de undevout, sinful, insidious hog, says I to Murkison. Get out that two thousand and lay it on the table. Obey with velocity, says I, for otherwise alternatives are impending. I am pre preferably a man of mildness but now and then I find myself in the middle of extremities. Such men as you, I went on after he had laid the money out, is what keeps the jails and courthouses going. You come up here to rob these men of their money. Does it excuse you, I asked, that they were trying to skin you? No, sir. You was gonna rob Peter to stand off Paul. You are 10 times worse, says I, than that green goods man. You go to church at home and pretend to be a decent citizen, but you'll come to Chicago and commit larceny from men that have built up a sound and profitable business by dealing with such contemptible scoundrels as you have tried to be this day. How do you know, says I, that that green goods man has not a large family dependent on his, upon his extortions? It's you supposedly respectable citizens who are always on the lookout to get something for nothing, says I, that support the lotteries in wildcat mines and stock exchanges and wiretappers of this country. If it wasn't for you, they'd go out of business. The green goods man that you was gonna rob, says I, studied maybe for years to learn his trade. Every turn he makes, he risks his money and liberty and maybe his life. You come up here all sanctified and vanaplied with respectability and a pleasing post office address to swindle them. If he gets the money, you can squeal to the police. If you get it, he hocks his gray suit to buy supper and says nothing. Mr. Tucker and me sized you up, says I, and came along to see that you got what you deserved. Hand over the money, says I, you grass-fed hypocrite. I put the 2000 which was still, which was all in $20 bills, in my inside pocket. Now get out your watch, says I to Murkison. No, I don't want it, says I. Lay it on the table and you sit in that chair until it ticks off an hour. Then you can go. If you make any noise or leave any sooner, we'll hand bill you all over Grassdale. I guess your high position there is worth more than $2,000 to you. Then me and Andy left. On the train, Andy was a long time silent. Then he says, Jeff, do you mind asking me, my asking you a question? Two, says I, or 40. Was that the idea you had, says he, when we started out with Murkison? Why, certainly, says I. What else could it have been? Wasn't it yours, too? In about half an hour, Andy spoke again. I think there are times when Andy don't exactly understand my system of ethics and moral hygiene. Jeff, says he, sometime when you have the leisure, I wish you'd draw off a diagram and footnotes of that conscience of yours. I'd like to have it to refer to occasionally. The end. The next story is called A Midsummer Masquerade. Satan, said Jeff Peters, is a hard boss to work for. When other people are having their vacation is when he keeps you the busiest. As old Dr. Watts or St. Paul or some other diagnostician says, he always finds somebody for idle hands to do. I remember one summer when me and my partner, Andy Tucker, tried to take a layoff from our professional and business duties. But it seems that our work followed us wherever we went. Now with a preacher, it's different. He can throw off his responsibilities and enjoy himself. On the 31st of May, he wraps up mosquito netting and tinfoil around the pulpit, grabs his niblick, breviary, and fishing pole, 
and hikes for Lake Como or Atlantic City, according to the size of the loudness with which he has been called by his congregation. And sir, for three months, he don't have to think about business except to hunt around in Deuteronomy and Proverbs and Timothy to find texts to cover and exculpate such little midsummer penances as drop, dropping a couple of Louis d'Or on Rouge or teaching a Presbyterian widow to swim. But I was going to tell you about mine and Andy's summer vacation. That wasn't one. We was tired of finance and all the branches of unsanctified ingenuity. Even Andy, whose brain rarely stopped working, began to make noises like a tennis cabinet. Hi ho, says Andy, I'm tired. I've got that steam up the yacht course air and ho for the Riviera feeling. I want to loaf and indict my soul, as Walt Whittier says. I want to play pinochle with Mary Dell's Val or give a nouting to the tenants on my Terrytown estates or do a monologue at a Chautauqua picnic in kilts or something summery and outside the line of routine and sandbagging. Patience, says I. You'll have to climb higher in the profession before you can taste the laurels that crown the footprints of the great captains of industry. Now what I'd like, Andy, says I, would be a summer sojourn in a mountain village far from scenes of larceny, labor, and overcapitalization. I'm tired too, and a month or so of sinlessness ought to leave us in good shape to begin again to take away the white man's burdens in the fall. Andy fell in with the rescuer at once. So we struck the general passenger agents of all the railroads for summer resort literature and took a week to study out where we should go. I reckon the first passenger agent in the world was that man Genesis. But there wasn't much competition in his day. And when he said, the Lord made the earth in six days and all very good, he hadn't any idea to what extent the press agents of the summer hotels would plagiarize him from then on. When we finished the booklets, we perceived easy that the United States from Pasadrumkeg, Maine to El Paso and from Skagway to Key West was a paradise of glorious mountain peaks, crystal lakes, new laid eggs, golf, girls, garages, cooling breezes, straw rides, open plumbing and tennis, and all within two hours ride. So me and Andy dumps the books out the back window and packs our trunk and takes the six o'clock tortoise flyer for Crow Knob, a kind of dernier resort in the mountains on the line of Tennessee and North Carolina. We was directed to a kind of private hotel called the Woodchuck Inn, and thither me and Andy bent and almost broke our footsteps over the rocks and stumps. The inn set back from the road in a big grove of trees, and it looked fine with its broad porches and a lot of women in white dresses rocking in the shade. The rest of Crow Knob was a post office and some scenery set at a 45 degree angle and a welkin. Well, sir, when we got to the gate, who do you suppose comes down the walk to greet us? Old smoke em out Smithers, who used to be the best open air painless dentist and electric liver pad faker in the Southwest. Old smoke em out is dressed clerico-rural and has the mingled air of a landlord in a claim jumper, which aspects he corroborates by telling us that he is the host and perpetrator of the Woodchuck Inn. I introduces Andy, and we talk about a few volatile topics, such as we'll go around at meetings of boards of directors and old associates as we three were. Old smoke em out leads us into a kind of summer house in the yard near the gate, and took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with his mighty right. Gents, says he, I'm glad to see ya. Maybe you could help me out of a scrape. I'm getting a bit old for street work, so I leased this Dog's Day Emporium so good things would come to me. Two weeks before the season opened, I get a letter signed Lieutenant Peary and one from the Duke of Marlborough, each wanting to engage port for a part of the summer. Well, sir, you gents know what a big thing for an obscure hustlery it would be to have for guests two gentlemen whose names are famous from long association with icebergs and the Cobergs. So I print a lot of handbills announcing that Woodchuck Inn would shelter these distinguished boarders during the summer, except in the places where it leaked, and I sends them out to towns around as far as Knoxville and Charlotte and Fishdam and Bowling Green. 
And now look up there on the porch, gents, says Smoke em Out, at them disconsolate specimens of their fair sex, waiting for the arrival of the Duke and the Lieutenant. The house is packed from rafters to cellar with hero worshippers. There's four normal school teachers and two abnormal. There's three high school graduates between 37 and 42. There's two literary old maids and one that can write. There's a couple of society women and a lady from Haw River. Two elocutionists are bunking in the corn crib, and I put cots in the hayloft for the cook and the society editress of the Chattanooga Opera Glass. You see how names draw, gents. Well, says I, how is it that you seem to be biting your thumbs at good luck? You didn't used to be that way. I ain't, though, says Smoke em Out. Yesterday was the day for the advent of the auspicious personages. I goes down to the depot to welcome them. Two apparently animate substances get off the train, both carrying bags full of croquet mallets and these magic lanterns with push buttons. I compares these integers with the original signatures to the letters, and, well, gents, I reckon the mistake was due to my poor eyesight. Instead of being the lieutenant, the daisy chain and wild verbena explorer was none other than Levi T. Peavy, a soda water clerk from Asheville. And the Duke of Marlborough turned out to be Theodore Drake of Murfreesboro, a bookkeeper in a grocery. What did I do? I kicked them both back on the train and watched them depart for the low lands. The low? Now you see the fix I'm in, gents, goes on smoke em out smithers. I told the ladies that the notorious visitors has been detained on the road by some unavoidable circumstances that made a noise like an ice jam in an heiress but they would arrive a day or two later. When they find out that they've been deceived, says Smoke em Out, every yard of cross-barred muslin and natural waved switch in the house will pack up and leave. It's a hard deal, says old Smoke em Out. Friend, says Andy, touching the old man on the esophagus. Why this jeremiad, when the polar regions and the portals of Blenheim are conspiring to hand you prosperity on a hallmarked silver solver, we have arrived. A light breaks out in Smoke em out space. Can you do it, gents? He asks. Could you do it? Could you play the polar man and the little duke for the nice ladies? Will you do it? I see that Andy is superimposed with his old hankering for the oral and polyglot system of buncoing. That man had a vocabulary of about 10,000 words and synonyms which arrayed themselves into contraband sophistries and parables when they came out. Listen, says Andy to old smoke em out. Can we do it? You behold before you, Mr. Smithers, two of the finest equipped men on earth for inveigling the proletariat, whether by word of mouth, sleight of hand, or swiftness of foot. Dukes come and go, explorers go and get lost, but me and Jeff Peters, says Andy, go after the come-ons forever. If you say so, we're the two illustrious guests you are expecting. And you'll find, says Andy, that we'll give you the true local color of the tidal rolls from the Aurora Borealis to the Ducal Fort Portcullis. Old smoke em out is delighted. He takes me and Andy up to the inn by an arm apiece, telling us on the way that the finest fruits of the can and luxuries of the fast freight should be ours without price as long as we would stay. On the porch, smoke em out says, Ladies, I have the honor to introduce his gracefulness, the Duke of Marlborough, and the famous inventor of the North Pole, Lieutenant Peary. The skirts all flutter and the rocking chairs squeak as me and Andy bows and then goes on with old smoke em up to register. And then we washed up and turned our cuffs and the landlord took us to the rooms he'd been saving for us and got out a demijohn of North Carolina real Mountain Dew. I expected trouble when Andy began to drink. He has the artistic metempsychosis, which is half drunk when sober and looks down upon airships when stimulated. After lingering with the demijohn, me and Andy goes out on the porch where the ladies are beginning to earn our keep. We sit in two special chairs and then the skull arms and the literateurs hunch their rockers close around us. One lady says to me, how did that last venture of yours turn out, sir? Now I'd clean forgot to have an understanding with Andy 
which, was, which I was to be, the Duke or the Lieutenant. And I couldn't tell from her question whether she was referring to Arctic or matrimonial expeditions. So I gave an answer that would cover both cases. Well, ma'am, says I, it was a freeze out, right smart of a freeze out, ma'am. And then the floodgates of Andy's perorations was opened, and I knew which of the renowned ostensible guests I was supposed to be. I wasn't either. Andy was both. And still furthermore, it seemed that he was trying to be the mouthpiece of the whole British nobility and of Arctic exploration from Sir John Franklin down. It was the union of corn whiskey and the conscientious fictional form that Mr. W.D. Howlitz admires so much. Ladies, says Andy, smiling semicircularly, I am truly glad to visit America. I do not consider the Magna Charta, says he, or gas balloons or snowshoes in any way a detriment to the beauty and charm of your American women, skyscrapers or the architecture of your icebergs. The next time, says Andy, that I go after the North Pole, all the Vanderbilts in Greenland won't be able to turn me out in the cold. I mean, make it hot for me. Tell us about one of your trips, Lieutenant, says one of the normals. Sure, says Andy, getting the decision over a hiccup. It was in the spring of last year that I sailed in the castle of Blenheim up to the latitude 87 degrees Fahrenheit and beat the record. Ladies, says Andy, it was a sad sight to see a duke allied by a civil and liturgical chattel mortgage to one of your first families lost in a region of semi-annual days. And then he goes on. At four bells, we sighted Westminster Abbey, but there was not a drop to eat. At noon, we threw out five sandbags and the ship rose 15 knots higher. At midnight, continues Andy, the restaurants closed. Sitting on a cake of ice, we ate seven hot dogs. All around us was snow and ice. Six times a night, the boatswain rose up and tore a leaf off the calendar so we could keep time with the barometer. At 12, says Andy, with a lot of anguish on his face, three huge polar bears sprang down the hatchway into the cabin. And then, what then, Lieutenant? Says the school ma'am excitedly. Andy gives a loud sob. The Duchess shook me. He cries out and slides out of the chair and weeps on the porch. Well, of course, that fixed the scheme. The women boarders all left up the next morning. The landlord wouldn't speak to us for two days, but when he found we had money to pay our way, he loosened up. So me and Andy had a quiet, restful summer after all, coming away from Crow Knob with $1,100 that we enticed out of old smoke em up playing 7-Up. The end. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful week.